scientist who has what we would call a religious experience. Uh, and it's an experience that took her out of the normal categories of thought, the normal categories of space and time, and in the course of the movie she has trouble talking about it, has trouble making sense of it. Um, and so that, that kind of uh, qualifies, if you will, for a religious experience that we're talking about this week. Another example would be, if you remember a few weeks back, we read Victor Turner's work on rites of passages. Um, and, and there's been a lot of work kind of by anthropologists, especially on rites of passages. And, and those are great times to observe um, the way that religious experiences are produced by social conditions. And when we say produced, we don't mean uh, generated, or we do mean generated, but we don't mean um, caused to have happened um, in kind of a, a, uh, a cynical way. We don't mean they're, they're produced like a movie production and it's all fake. And so what we're talking about, those conditions that generate um, the places in social structure, structure, the moments in social time that allow for um, a religious experience like William James would talk about. And in Victor Turner's work, we, saw the, we see in these liminal moments when people are outside of social time, outside of social structure, they're in a different space, in a space where different of experiences of body and of mind and of ideas are actually allowed and encouraged to happen. I, I do, I study a little bit of this in my own work and, and trying to, to kind of get sense, get a sense of how these very individualistic experiences like being born again or being on a high mountaintop or having a mountain high, mountaintop high, how these have social characteristics to them. There's patterns of of what they look like, of what the accounts sound like, and of the places and times and spaces where they happen. And so that's what sociolog sociologists bring to the study of religious experience. Um, now what's interesting though is that religious experience, the study of religious experience hasn't really been big in, the so in sociology. Um, and I think the main reason why that, why that is is because Religious experience, that, that phrase, that concept, that term, suggests a subjective element to religion. And sociologists are notorious for having a difficulty making sense of what is uh, subje the subjective experience of humans. Um, and so there's a sense that sociologists always have of um, that if, if they can't themselves kind of experience or even touch things like class or race or religious ritual or religious belief. So those are all things we can kind of touch in some way. We can kind of analyze, conceptualize. Um, whereas religious experience seems to be this something, this phenomenon that is so subjective in the feeling that it's hard to kind of make sense out of. Now I, I in, in the course of the rest of this lecture, want to push that and say like, no, religious experience actually should be something a sociologist uh, look at because we know at least from the narrative biographies of people that have had religious experiences that they're important. They're important autobiographical markers in time. They're important for connecting to religious conversion and, and changing behavior. And they also seem to be very uh, important for, these, for being these moments where people discover uh, self-knowledge um, that can change the way that they move through the rest of their life. So they are important things for us to study. But for this week, we, we took a look mostly at William James. And that's because psychologists have tended to kind of lead the way in the study of religious experiences. There's some very interesting stuff, and some of you, I think, have read this stuff, uh, I could tell from your post, on what we might call uh, religion and mind. And these are modern day uh, uh, psychiatrists uh, or psychologists who are trying to study the, the way religious experience happens uh, kind of in here. And when I point in here, I don't mean just, they, they look at the brain and brain structures, but they also think in terms of the mind. And the mind is different than just the biological brain because the mind is those collections of processes that connect with our environment and have to do with the, with the way cognition happens in our, in our head. And so scientists nowadays are doing things like, you know, sticking something in, I don't even know how the heck they do this. You can tell them a sociologist sticking something in and poking a part of the brain and seeing if, if, it, if it registers a sensation over here or seeing if it causes somebody to relax 
or somebody to have ideas that that are different than kind of normal one plus one logic. So um, scientists are involved in that sort of research. And, and I personally think that's interesting because I think there are neurological or biological bases uh, to religious experience, especially because religious experience is tied in with emotion. Uh, it's tied in with the way we make sense of, of the world and our own sensations. That's all tied in. Um, but I would say, and this is a big but, is that arguments that try and find religion and religious experience totally in the mind are problematic because um, they don't tell us how these experiences come to be from the social world, so how the social world can engender these experiences. They don't tell us completely what these experiences look like so the actual kind of content and themes of religious experiences. And they don't tell us anything about how these religious experiences might matter for the way humans live in the social world. So I, I love some of this, uh, um, uh, this kind of science, or we should say uh, natural science or biological science basis to exploring religion. But I don't think it's a full the, the full explanation for religion and religious experience. So this brings us all still back to Williams James, who, who dates from the early 1900s, before all this kind of uh, modern day brain, uh, brain experimentation. And uh, you all read James closely, and you understood him. Um, and, and, and James James is basically based in a late 1800s, early 1900s school of, of pragmatic thought. Now that word pragmatic has a very particular meaning for us today in our language. But pragmatism was actual, actually a school of thought um, that tied uh, values and ideas into uh, actual moments of experience and action. So instead of kind of coming from a model of education and a model of philosophy that tries to kind of find values and ideas by looking outside of time, if you will, and outside of, of, uh, of human life, the pragmatist said, no, we should be able to discover kind of behaviors and values within our actual, the actual problems we have in everyday life. So these pragmatists, as they were called, like William James, were trying to discover ways of living that could actually be helpful kind of in the flow of the daily problems of life. And his method, and this would be common for the pragmatist, uh, was basically kind of pay attention to what was happening, to pay attention what people were saying uh, in the actual kind of themes of their life. And so as best I can tell, his book, of which you read some passages from, is he basically used his kind of content analysis. He talked, he did a lot of talking to people and a lot of reading about what people's experience of religion was and what their religious experiences were like. And then he kind of did a content analysis and, and pulled out these four themes that he's talked about. And you guys had a really good debate about these four themes, uh, one of them being ineffability, which is, in his mind, uh, d uh, uh, religious experience, uh, experience that had to, be, had to be directly experienced. You couldn't just kind of read about a religious experience. It had to be this kind of very bod bodily experience. But then he said, you know, secondly, religious experiences are noetic. And what he meant by that was that they're not just emotional, but they actually have an influence in the mind, in how we, th how we experience and think about our lives and the world around us. And then he said also religious experiences, third, were transient. He even, he even said that they were this very kind of short amount of time. And finally, he says that religious experiences, while religious people might have all sorts of things like meditations and prayer and rituals to, to try and bring about religious experience, the actual religious experience itself feels passive because it feels like it's something that's given to somebody by kind of a divine or transhuman force. Um, so some of you who in your reply said, well, could like, uh, you know, smoking peyote or, 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 uh, or marijuana be a religious experience for William James? And I'm guessing he would say no, because what he would want to say is because it's, in, 